It's the Happy Families Podcast. It's the podcast for the time poor parent who just wants answers now. Once a month, we have a look at the latest science that affects us as parents, what we can do to be better for our kids, what we can do to be better for ourselves. And Kylie, this month, three incredible, really fascinating, really fascinating studies to talk about. Walk us through what we've got and let's go. We're going to talk about the positive outcomes that come from being connected Mm -hmm. and well-being. Yep. The power of touch and how it has the capacity to ease pain, depression, and anxiety. Great. And we're also going to look at how anger is bad for our health in more ways than we thought. Yeah, new research coming out highlighting that anger is literally, literally killing us. So where do you want to start? Do you want to start with internet connection and well-being? Let's start there. Okay. One of my favorite psychology researchers is a guy called Andy Shabulski. He works at the University of Oxford at the Oxford Internet Institute. And he's the guy who famously a few years ago said that the amount of uh, screen time you have is the equivalent of how many potatoes you eat in terms of its impact on your mental health. I keep telling you that. (laughs) But it's okay to be on the screen. Why do we worry about it? Is that what you mean? No, but I think that for the average person... I think we're clever enough to work this stuff out. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a huge amount of noise being made at the moment because there are, are, there are too many of our kids and too many adults who are literally finding their lives being destroyed because of screens. And so this has become a massive hot button issue. We've covered it quite a lot here on the Happy Families podcast. I want to tell you about this study because it highlights the great complexity of what we're talking about. So Andy is, uh, well, it's actually Professor Andrew Shabulski, uh, but Andy is a really, really smart guy, incredible to talk to, and so insightful, really looks at things in unique ways. He's done this study with more than 2 million participants, measuring their psychological well-being from 2006 to 2021. We're talking about 168 countries, and using the power of compute, He has done 33,792 different statistical models and subsets of data and found in 85% of the case, 84.9% of cases, positive associations, statistically significant positive associations between being connected to the internet and well-being. So whether it's Latin America or Asia or Africa, whether it's Australia or the United States, doesn't matter where it is, internet technologies and platforms have psychological consequences. There's a lot of debate around those psychological consequences, but he's indicating based on this research that in 85% of cases, looking at eight different indicators, life satisfaction, daily negative and positive experiences, social well-being, physical well-being, community well-being, an experience of purpose, an overwhelming positive correlation between all those measures of well-being and being able to use the internet. Now, there could be any number of other things that are impacting here. What he's saying very, very clearly is, and this is a direct quote, overall, we found that average associations were consistent across internet adoption predictors and well-being outcomes with those who had access to or actively used the internet reporting meaningfully greater well-being than those who did not. To me, this is all about doing things in moderation, whether it's I enjoy chocolate and gelato for dessert. (laughs) Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or chocolate chip cookies and milk, or whether it's I like, I don't know, going surfing. Mm. Like, it doesn't matter what it is. If I'm doing it all day, every day, to the detriment of the rest of my life, then anything we do has the potential to be detrimental to our well-being. To me, this is a really, this is a really big challenge that Andy Shibolsky is throwing to the world with this data set. And, and I th- I believe that he's right. Now, here's what we know. We know that our young people, children, adolescents, and even young adults, as a result of their limited brain development, their lack of neurological maturation, they have less capacity to inhibit and are more likely to be compelled and addicted. We know that no matter what unhealthy behavior they commence, the earlier they start it, the more likely it is that they'll have problems with it later in life. And even even at the time. But as you're sharing this, I'm not thinking about children. This is not a study about children. That's exactly right. This is this is a study about adults. And so for me, who didn't grow up with computers, who didn't grow up with screens, I don't have a huge skill set even in them. It's not something that draws me in the same way as it is for the kids. But As a parent, our job is to obviously still scaffold them Mm. and provide them with the 
boundaries that they need because they don't have the skill set yet. So a couple of important things here. Number one, just to clarify, we are not talking about teenagers. We're talking about people overall, two, two million people around the world overall, and we are seeing an increase in well-being. I watched you in the last month and a half adopt uh, Snapchat as your new favorite app. <laughs> and and I've literally seen a well-being boost. I've, I've seen the joy and delight that you've had as you've had uh, filters going through your life and through your screen and just just how much fun it's been for you. I've, I've sworn off social media, but recently I've been playing around with Reddit a little bit and I'm I'm really enjoying it. It's it's delightful, but it's got to be balanced. Mm. Uh, overall, Andy Shapolsky's research shows that if we can get the balance right, and we need to be mindful that there are very real risks and concerns. There are dangerous things out there. We're, we're dealing with bullying. We're dealing with racism. We're dealing with sexism. We're dealing with homophobia. We're dealing with all of the isms that you can think of. They're all all over the internet. We've got to make sure that we're safe. But if we can do that, it seems that overall, the vast majority of people find their lives and their well-being are improved by having access to screens and the internet. We will link to the paper. I mean, it's a fascinating paper. It's heavy. It's deep. There's a lot there. It's called A Multiverse Analysis, A Multiverse Analysis of the Associations Between Internet Use and Well-Being. It was published in Technology, Mind and Behaviour and written up in the journal Nature as well by Mati Vuare and Andrew K. Shabolsky. Study number two. The power of touch. I like this one. Yeah, this one's far less controversial. <laughs> I just like a good massage and now I have even more reason. Well, this is a brand new report published recently in Nature Human Behaviour. Julian Packheiser and colleagues have made a major attempt to understand what's really going on with physical and mental health and the benefits of touch. 217 touch studies were analysed in what we call a meta-analysis, a systematic review of all the research that's out there. A total of almost 13,000 people looking at the impact of touch on both babies and also adults. And the researchers found essentially that there is a, a really substantial impact on well-being, both physical and mental well-being, when we get touched. About a month ago, I attended the Resilient Kids Conference with you. Yes. And we got to see Karen Young from Hey Sigmund share her talk all about anxiety and mm. big feelings. Mm. And she actually talks about this and she just shared that that little part in the middle of your back, top of your back, if you just rub that, it actually activates the vagus nerve. Right. And the vagus nerve is known as the wandering nerve. It goes right through the body from the brainstem, right through all of your organs down to just below your waist or hips. And and it is what we need so that it, it, when that's activated, our parasympathetic nervous system is activated, which means that we're in rest and digest mode rather than fight or flight mode. What's interesting to me about that is as a parent- All of it's interesting. The whole thing's interesting. No, but as a parent, you instinctively go there. Like that's where I would pat the babies to sleep. Yeah. Or when they ask for a back rub, that's where you go to. That's why whenever- It's so intuitive. Whenever I hug you, that's what I do. I just keep on rubbing that Oh, part. is that mm -hmm. right? Okay. Let's talk about the science for a second now that you've shared that. Uh, and by the way, Karen Young gives great hugs. Well, I got the best hug from Karen. The well, that, that's why I was saying <laughs> it, it, it. It was literally one of the highlights of your day. Uh, here's what the researchers found. For newborns, they, they basically found medium-sized effects on uh, well-being. They found that physical touch lowers stress hormone levels, specifically cortisol drops, uh, liver enzymes, as well as respiration, temperature regulation, and weight gain. Touch interventions had medium to large effects on all of those areas in a positive direction. So, so good. Um, and for adults, touch improved various measures of both uh, physical and mental well-being, but it was especially effective with adults at reducing pain and also reducing feelings of depression and anxiety. So does it matter who does the touching? Uh, not if you're an adult. In fact, researchers even found that the robotic massage tools that you can use they can be just as beneficial for adults as having human-to-human -human touch. Although, although the benefits of being touched by another person were bigger for mental health. Did they say this is a daily thing? <laughs> you really like this study. <laughs> you really like this study. Uh, babies babies uh, enjoy bigger benefits when it comes from a parent, usually the mum in these studies, than yeah. from a health professional. They just like to be touched by the person that they know and love. So who administers the touch for babies? It does matter a little bit more for adults, a little bit less, but there's benefits absolutely no matter what. 
So we'll link to that study in the show notes as well. It's a beautiful study. And for those of you who are scientifically inclined, you can get a whole lot more about the best uh, best places to be touched, uh, the best contexts in which to be touched, and uh, how it affects males and females differently and uh, different age groups generally as well. It's just just a really delightful study. Well, study number three is all about the fact that anger is bad for our health in more ways than one. Yeah. So years and years ago, I read a book called Anger Kills. It was by, I think I think his name was Redford Williams. I, I may have that wrong, but it was a guy, a guy called Williams and he wrote this book, Anger Kills. Uh, new research is supporting what Williams wrote all those years ago. And it's showing really clearly that anger is affecting our brains, our heart, and our gastrointestinal system in really significant ways. Basically, stress hormones are killing us. High levels of stress hormones damage nerve cells in our brain. They create bloating, constipation, stomach pain, and other symptoms in our gut and in our gastrointestinal system. And then there's the impact that it has on our heart. Some researchers examined the impact of three different emotions on the heart, anger, anxiety, and sadness. They got Uh, participants to either do a task that made them angry or a task that made them anxious or one that was uh, designed to induce sadness. And then they simply tested the functioning of the blood vessels in each participant using a blood pressure cuff to squeeze and release the blood flow in the arm. And the people in the angry group had worse blood flow than those in the others. Like their their blood vessels- Well, your whole body tenses. Yeah, their blood vessels didn't dilate as much. Yeah. So over time, if you're getting these chronic insults to your arteries because you get angry a lot, that leaves you at greater risk of heart disease. So the research really points strongly in the direction that anger is literally killing us. Well, I was just thinking that our previous study all about the power of touch was going to be helpful here, but <laughs> yes. I know you need touch. that <laughs> when our kids are angry, the last thing they want is somebody to touch them and especially give them a back rub. So what are the solutions? Like, How can we help to just lower those levels of anger? Yeah, I think, I think really we need to be self-aware enough to recognize if we're getting too angry too often or j- just too much, recognize that there's this connection here. Uh, if there is a prolonged negative emotion – it's really bad for your health. So uh, it's normal to get angry, but we've got to be able to repair it and fix things up fairly quickly. We know that getting enough sleep and getting enough exercise is going to be helpful. But the last thing that I think really matters is, and this is something that you and I have talked about many times on the podcast, slow down your reactions. Stephen Covey talked about that space between the stimulus and the response. And if we can just pause and slow things down and choose our reactions more carefully, we're less likely to get angry and we're going to do more for our mental health. So that is study number three. We will link to all of those studies in our show notes. Thanks for listening. The Happy Families podcast is produced by Justin Rulon from Bridge Media. Craig Bruce is our executive producer. If you would like more information about making your family happier, we'd love for you to join us at happyfamilies.com.au. 